Caregiving can sometimes feel like an impossible struggle. Caregivers may be torn between taking care of loved ones and trying to maintain balance in life. The good news is that it doesn't have to be that way. The Caring Generation with host Pamela D. Wilson is here to focus on the conversation of caring. You're not alone. In fact, you're in exactly the right place to share stories and learn tips and resources to help you and your loved ones. So now, please welcome the host of The Caring Generation, Pamela D. Wilson. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, speaker, consultant, and guardian of the Caring Generation. The Caring Generation focuses on the conversation of caring, giving us permission to talk about aging, the challenges of caregiving, and everything in between. It's no surprise that needing care or becoming a caregiver changes everything. The Caring Generation is here to guide you along the journey to let you know that you're not alone. You are in exactly the right place to share stories and learn about caregiving programs and resources to help you and your loved ones plan for what's ahead. Invite your aging parents, spouses, family, and friends to listen to the show. If you have a question or an idea for a future program, share your idea with me by responding to my social media posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. This week, we're talking about 10 steps for how to deal with dementia, Alzheimer's, and memory loss related to other illnesses like Parkinson's disease or a brain injury, beginning with the point of diagnosis. So whether you are the person diagnosed and you can still fully participate in the process, or if you're a caregiver for a loved one who is diagnosed, all these steps will still work. The person diagnosed with the memory loss or the caregiver will be the leader in taking these steps. So let's get started for number one for how to deal with dementia, which is to adjust to the emotional consequences of receiving a memory loss diagnosis. Sometimes the diagnosis comes as quite a shock for the person diagnosed the people in their family, and the caregiver. In other instances, there might have been suspicion of memory loss, but for some reason, a delay in seeking or receiving a medical diagnosis. Receiving a formal diagnosis as challenging as dementia or Alzheimer's or any type of memory loss is, puts the person with dementia, the memory loss, and their caregivers in control of responding to the diagnosis. The progression of dementia and Alzheimer's varies in every situation, so there may be an ongoing sense of uncertainty, things up in the air. This brings us back to the question of how to deal with dementia. Like any unexpected diagnosis or event in life, being proactive in learning about identifying options, and creating a plan can help you feel better about how you will respond, which is part of how to deal with dementia. Life throws curves every single day. Caregivers tell me they don't know whether they should talk openly with an elderly parent or a spouse about dementia or Alzheimer's. These discussions can be tricky if Memory loss has progressed so much before receiving a diagnosis from a doctor that a loved one can't understand that they have memory loss. Honestly, I've seen this go both ways. Families who never discuss the diagnosis, who provide care and comfort by saying things like, well, everyone gets a little forgetful now and then. They avoid using the words dementia or Alzheimer's. Then, caregivers struggle when a loved one wants more information about dementia or Alzheimer's, and they're afraid that a loved one may become agitated by learning more, so they're not sure what to do. On one hand, if the loved one is asking for information, I think they have a right to know, but the caregiver should carefully consider how to present the information, by presenting a little information and monitoring the response and presenting more information 
and monitoring the response, and then making adjustments where necessary. There's no doubt that having memory loss is frightening. The best case scenario happens when the diagnosis comes in the early stages. When the person with dementia is involved and wants to know everything and is interested in making a plan. Dealing with dementia means learning to respond appropriately to a lot of unexpected situation. For example, simple thing. We've all experienced being cut off by another car while driving on the freeway or having someone else cut in line in front of us. We all have the choice about how to respond. Do you choose to become angry and honk, honk, honk and respond rudely? Or do you let it go and ignore the interaction? Because you realize that other people's actions are more about them, what is happening in their life today, the stresses others experience rather than their interaction with you is likely the cause of their behaviors. It's not you that they're reacting to. It's probably something or someone else, but you happen to be there at the moment and you are the receiver of their anger, frustration, or upset. So the idea of how you learn to respond to others is very critical. Because as memory loss progresses, your loved one may experience behavioral changes. If you're unfamiliar with memory loss behaviors, a person with dementia can participate in repetitive speech patterns and become upset, afraid, or agitated. Therefore, learning how to respond in a calming and reassuring manner is a good thing. By responding in the opposite way, In an angry or threatening manner, the person with dementia will likely become more agitated, angry, and frustrated with you. As you can see, dealing with dementia benefits from learning how to adjust emotionally, accept the diagnosis, and learn and practice to respond with patience, kindness, and more empathy than you ever thought you had. Number two for how to deal with dementia is to be proactive. Being proactive means not digging your head in the sand and waiting for the diagnosis to worsen before you are forced to take action. Dementia and Alzheimer's progress differently for every individual. However, there are common factors like increased confusion, poor judgment, and inability to learn new things, memory loss getting worse, more repetitive questioning, needing reminders about taking medications, eating, bathing, changing clothes, and completing other grooming tasks like brushing teeth or washing hair. Persons with dementia can also experience delusions, paranoia, and accuse their caregivers of doing things that the caregiver isn't doing. If you're a caregiver for a person with dementia, learn as much as possible about the progression of memory loss changes in health, and potential behavior so that you are prepared. If you are the person diagnosed with memory loss, learn as much as possible to prepare for your future. Number three for how to deal with dementia is to learn about the importance of ongoing medical care and aspects of health that are important for managing memory loss. If you see a primary care physician, You may also want to establish a relationship with a geriatrician. A geriatrician is a specialist in healthcare for persons over age 60 or 65. Consider a neurologist. Neurologists are experts in treating diseases of the brain and nervous system. Other specialists that treat and can be beneficial for managing memory loss are geriatric psychiatrists who prescribe medications for behaviors and other health conditions. Neuropsychologists examine the relationship between memory loss and behaviors. That geriatric pharmacist, he or she can look at medications prescribed and talk to you about potential adverse interactions. If you've done homework on memory loss, you may be aware that there are medications reported to slow down the rate of memory loss. This is also something to investigate to determine 
if it makes sense, if there's a benefit. For more on managing medications in the elderly, listen to the Caring Generation podcast episode 21 called How to Manage Medications for Elderly Parents and my interview with Dr. Nia Jane, a geriatric psychiatrist. Beyond medications, other actions like a healthy diet, regular exercise, and maintaining social activities benefit the mind. Number four for how to deal with dementia follows along with ongoing medical care and being proactive with health. This step is appointing an agent under power of attorney. It means deciding who will help you or the person with dementia make medical and financial decisions when memory loss prevents the ability to comprehend or evaluate information and make decisions. Creating these documents is often best completed with an elder law, estate planning, or probate attorney instead of using an online form so that no one takes advantage of you or the person diagnosed with memory loss when there's an inability to care for oneself. At the same time, you want to complete a living will that says what you want for your care in the event of an emergency or at the end of your life than a will or a trust depending on your financial situation. The medical component that can help you make some of these decisions if you're struggling to complete legal documents falls under the Medicare benefit. It's called advanced care planning. Advanced care planning is a session with your doctor to talk about your health specific to diagnoses, and decisions that you may want to make about your health as time progresses. The next step, number five, for how to deal with dementia is to begin creating a file of all your important information in a single place. So that if someone, a caregiver, or your agent under power of attorney needs to access this information, it's readily available without spending hours trying to hunt down the information. There are three categories for this, medical, financial, and household or personal. Medical information is a list of your doctors or providers and their contact information. If you signed up for your doctor's medical portal, you'll want to create a list of logins and passwords and do the same for any other online sites or accounts you use. If you're curious and you're thinking, well, should I use a medical portal? Is it beneficial? What are the pros? What are the cons? I have a podcast for this. I'll put the information in the show notes. Then you want to create a list of your prescription medications along with your pharmacy information. Finally, make copies of all important cards, Medicare, your ID or driver's license, passport, social security, any other health insurance, credit cards, other cards you use regularly. These copies will come in handy if any of this information is lost, which is possible. I've known people with memory loss who lose their wallets or purses. And trying to recreate all the information, it's a lot of work. And sometimes it doesn't happen. Continuing with the medical background, create a list of past surgeries, allergies to medications or foods. While all of this information should typically be available in your online medical records, it's good to double check it to ensure that this information is correct while there is enough memory to be able to do this. In some cases, if a previous doctor's office closed and you didn't participate in online medical records, all your information can be lost if you didn't request a paper copy before the office closed. In some situations, healthcare providers can change medical record systems. This means that the prior information may be lost. In my opinion, ensuring you have access to all of your medical history, even if you have to keep copies, keeps you in control. You can always scan the information so that you're not storing reams of paper in your house. Also, If you have original copies of legal documents, life insurance policies, other important paperwork, consider storing these in a locked filing cabinet in your home or in a safety deposit box at the bank. Then there are your financial records like bank accounts and investment account information, 
a list of household or personal bills, things like electricity, water, trash, lawn care, your mortgage, your accountant, your hairdresser, all of these people. While gathering all of this information can take time, being organized really is an awesome thing to do because it can help you create a plan for the future because you're going through and finding and reviewing all of this information and updating it to make sure it's current. A plan for the future may also include a financial budget for the costs of care and how you plan to manage continuing to live in your home setting or somewhere else. Consider whether your preference will be to live in an independent or assisted living community if eventually living at home is no longer a possibility. Suppose you're unsure about how to make all these planning decisions related to healthcare and finances. In that case, you can hire a private care manager or a caregiving expert who has expertise in budgeting for care costs. Let's take a short break and then we'll discuss steps six to 10 for dealing with dementia. Caregiving doesn't have to be a do-it-yourself job. This podcast, The Caring Generation, answers questions caregivers ask. It's available worldwide on my website and your favorite podcast and music apps like Apple, Spotify, Spreaker, and others. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert on the caring generation. Stay with me. I'll be right back. This is Pamela D. Wilson, caregiver expert, advocate, and author on The Caring Generation. Check out my website, PamelaDWilson.com, where you will find my online caregiver program, book The Caregiving Trap, my caregiver blog, this podcast, and articles in my caregiver library. There's something for everyone on my website, PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back to How to Deal with Dementia. Number six can be a challenging subject, especially for anyone who has lived all their life independently and now is faced with an unpleasant future proposition of relying on other people. How to deal with dementia includes a safety component that if you have memory loss, you may need to talk to others to help you evaluate. If you're the caregiver for a person with dementia, It's up to you to monitor safety and then find a way to discuss concerns in a positive way with an elderly parent or spouse. Safety concerns include things like accidentally leaving stove burners on that could result in a house fire, forgetting to turn off a sink that results in a house flood, and a lot of other activities that most of us take for granted. How many times do you leave the house and you can't remember if you turned off a light or your curling iron, or if you close the garage door. I've done this myself, and I have now created processes to make sure I do these things and don't forget. But these are the issues that persons diagnosed with dementia experience. So imagine how these can become more complicated for a person who has memory loss. The ability to drive a car safely will eventually become a concern. If you're a person with dementia, have you ever gotten lost when driving? I've had clients who did this and ended up in another state after making a wrong turn. Does your car have dents and you can't remember how they got there? What about your garage door? Have you damaged your garage door while trying to put the car in the garage? The main comment I hear from people with dementia who don't want to stop driving is, well, I've been driving all of my life. I'll be safe. Don't worry about me. While caregivers worry about the person with dementia, they also worry about children playing in the street and drivers of other cars who may be injured if a person with memory loss puts a foot on the accelerator instead of the brake. Some states have driver simulation programs for persons with dementia, that can estimate the likelihood of becoming involved in a car accident. 
If your state has a program, I highly recommend that you be evaluated regularly. Other safety issues include wandering out of the home and becoming lost. As we discussed earlier, persons with dementia will eventually need ongoing reminders to bathe, eat, take medications, and eventually total assistance with all care activities. These topics can be a huge disagreement with family caregivers who may witness concerns and especially if the person with dementia is in denial or can't recognize or remember that these events are happening. For this reason, if you're the person with dementia, you must find somebody, you must appoint someone that you can talk to about these concerns and who will talk to you about these concerns and who you will trust, believing that they are telling you the truth, that they're giving you the facts. Trying to help an elderly parent or a spouse who is a safety risk, but who denies these issues are happening, is a significant frustration and a worry for family caregivers. Number seven is to plan for your care. While it might be hard to imagine what comes next, assume that you may need in-home caregivers if family or friends can't help enough or help at all. Assume that you may need to move into an independent, then assisted, then memory care community. Investigate these services and tour these communities today while you are physically and mentally able. Look at the costs. How will you pay for the care you need? Or will you run out of money and need to apply for Medicaid to pay for your care? If so, investigate what Medicaid means and what services are offered today. Don't wait. Contact your state agency of long-term care for information about the application process. If you have an elder law or a state planning attorney, ask them about Medicaid. How to deal with dementia really means placing yourself in the best possible position to understand your options so that you can put a plan in writing. Now you may be thinking, well, why do I need a plan in writing? It's really simple. Because your children or other people involved in your life might have huge disagreements when your memory loss progresses, and you may not be able at that time to state your preferences. So remove the guesswork and potential family disputes and knock down drag out fights within your family during and after your life. Make your wishes known for what you want today. Also about whether you want to be buried and in what location or cremated and have your ashes placed or distributed. While these topics may be uncomfortable to discuss and you'd rather not, they really are the practical way to deal with dementia and all the issues related to caregiving, aging, and health. Next up, number eight, create a memory and how to care for you book. While this might seem like one more thing to do, this book is for your family and care staff who may eventually care for you. Providing background about your life is essential so that your caregivers, whether they're family or professional, know your personal history and they have a starting point for conversations. Reminiscing is an essential activity for persons with dementia and their caregivers. Include photos of yourself when you were younger and information about your likes and dislikes, your career. For example, things like foods you never want to be forced to eat and foods you love. Your favorite type of music, programs you enjoy watching on television, favorite actors, movies, whether you prefer taking showers or a bath. Know that there will be time when a person with dementia, and this could be you, will be unable to share this information. So for caregivers, having this knowledge will help them to provide care that supports your needs and provides comfort. Along these lines is number nine for how to deal with dementia, which is keeping a daily journal. This activity is beneficial for the person diagnosed and also for family caregivers because research confirms that journaling benefits mental health and stress because you're documenting your thoughts and your feelings. People in the early stages of memory loss 
can do this. They can have a notebook that they can write information in and refer to regarding the previous day's activities, which can be very helpful. They can also document things that are going to happen in the future, like going out to lunch or going to a doctor appointment. Keeping a journal will not likely work if someone is in the mid to later stages of memory loss because the memory loss is so short that it becomes impractical or really impossible to document anything. For family caregivers, this journal can also serve as a list of things to do and reminders, sort of like a personal ongoing calendar that can help caregivers organize life when everything seems to be spinning out of control. For the family, having a journal that a loved one with memory loss created can be a source of comfort that shares the feelings of an elderly parent or a spouse through their health journey, and it's something that you can have after they pass away. And last, but certainly not the least important, probably one of the most important things for how to deal with dementia, number 10, is to maintain social activities, outings, connection with friends and families as long as possible. A loss of connection is a concern that I frequently hear from caregivers of persons with dementia. Caregivers tell me that friends and family stop visiting. While there can be a lot of reasons for this, it's important to understand that dementia and Alzheimer's are the diagnoses that are frightening for many people. And unless you're the one involved in the day-to-day -day care of a person with dementia, you probably don't know how to respond empathetically to repetitive statements or even know that reminiscing is a great activity that you can do with a friend who has memory loss or that being a visitor can give that family caregiver a relief and a break. So my recommendation on this one is for the person with dementia and their caregivers to write a letter or letters, either individually to your friends and family or a group letter to inform about the diagnosis and the desire for ongoing contact. It's truly almost as if a family dealing with dementia has to educate everyone on the outside about the disease and restate the importance of relationships and continued visits. In many cases, the family caregiver may have to become the social director, creating a visitor's calendar and inviting friends and family. As difficult as it is for a family caregiver to watch a loved one progress through memory loss, the transition is as difficult for friends and for family. So it's essential to make things simple, to focus on simple activities. Encourage walks, looking through photo albums, and other activities that the person with memory loss can still participate in. Just because a person with memory loss is starting to get forgetful, it doesn't mean that all of their life experiences still aren't in there somewhere. For more tips on how to talk to a parent with dementia and how to talk to family members and friends about dementia and the importance of continuing to visit, listen to The Caring Generation, episode 26, and my interview with Dr. Stephen Post. Thank you all for continuing to post questions for this podcast and all of the videos that I share on my YouTube channel. This is Pamela D. Wilson, family caregiving expert on The Caring Generation. If you're looking for answers and support to caregiving and aging questions, visit my website, PamelaDWilson.com, where you'll find my caregiving library, online caregiver course, the Caring for Aging Parents blog, my book, The Caregiving Trap, and an extensive step-by-step -step online caregiver program to help you learn the A to Z of caring for elderly parents that includes a section on memory loss. Again, thanks for being here. I look forward to being with you again soon. God bless you all. I'm sending love to everyone. Sleep well tonight. Have a fabulous day tomorrow. And enjoy each day until we are here together again. Tune in each week for The Caring Generation with host Pamela D. Wilson. Come join the conversation and see how Pamela can provide solutions and peace of mind for everyone. Here on Pamela D. Wilson's The Caring Generation.